Thanks so much for being with us today, Kathleen. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, and thanks for everybody who's, who's tuning in. Um, my name is Kathleen Clark, and I am the Marine Stewardship and Education Specialist for the Kohala Center. Um, and just briefly, the Kohala Center is an independent research, education, and INA stewardship nonprofit, um, really working towards help promoting healthier ecosystems. So um, lucky to be a part of that organization and um, really lucky to be here presenting about our, like Chrissy said, our beloved Kahalu'u Bay today. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So like I said, my name is Kathleen Clark and I am the Marine Stewardship and Education Specialist for the Kohala Center. Um, since 2006, we have been uh, down at Kahalu'u Bay uh, as, as stewards of the place and um, through a program called Reef Teach. And um, we're just so lucky to be able to be down there and to care for such an amazing place. And um, I feel honored today to, to be able to share a glimpse of what we do and some of our accomplishments over the past few years. Um, but before I go ahead and do that, I really want to acknowledge um, Cindy Punihale. She's the director of our program, and she has uh, been basically leading and guiding us the whole way through, and our program would not be what it is um, if it weren't for her. So we're just so, uh, so lucky to have her. Um, so lucky to have her as our guiding, our guiding light um our our beacon so we are we're we're so lucky so i just wanted to acknowledge her and um and before i got started great so i'm going to move along here and if anyone has any questions um please let me know or i think you can raise your hand if you're in the zoom app um or you can type it in the chat and we'll be happy to ask uh, answer your questions as we go so Kahalu'u Bay um, is often referred to as Aina Le Ali'i. This is uh, otherwise known as the land adorned by chiefs. Um, this really tells us about the significance of the place um, and the history and the past. Um, it has a storied past of different chiefs uh, who lived there and made their home there, um, significant figures in history. Um, the name Kahalu'u literally means the diving place or to be deeply immersed. And if you've ever been there, um, you've probably spent some time underwater um, and you may have felt deeply immersed in probably one of the most beautiful coral reefs um, on Hawaii Island. Um, the area of Keaho and Kahalu'u is known to have one of the highest concentrations of import important cultural sites on Hawaii Island. Um, it's a complex of heiau, um, bathing ponds, uh, canoe ho houses, and other really important cultural sites that some of which are still visible today. Um, some of the ones you might recognize are uh, Ku'emanu Heiau, which is near um, St. Peter's Church in front of the surf break at Kahalu'u. Um, the Waikua A'ala Pond, which is actually on the shoreline at Kahalu'u. And many of you who swam in the bay at Kahalu'u know the Pa'o Ka Menahune, uh, the wall that um, nearly um, encloses the whole bay. So, um, like I said, they all tell us the importance of this place and the storied history. Um, Kahalu'u is also known as a place for observation and deeper understanding. Um, known for its bounty and abundance of fresh water that flows from the, from the rocks and food um, from the abundance of fish in the bay. Um, and although it's gone through much change, uh, there's still this subtle magnetism that draws us there and that draws people from all over the world. Um, and it continues to really just teach us so much. So this is Kahalu'u, a photo of Kahalu'u um, in the from the 1950s. And if you've seen it recently, it looks very different. Um, but you can, some things that I like to point out are the extent of the sand. Um, you can see the, extent, the sand extends much farther out than it does now. 
um, the neo trees, the coconut trees, there, there was an abundance of coconut trees, a coconut grove, maybe we'll call it. And there was really little to no development. So this is from the 1950s. And sometimes when I'm out in the bay underwater, I like to think about what it might have looked like back then and how abundant the coral was. And even if you kind of look in a little closer into that photo, you can see um, the extent of the coral reef there as well. So here's a picture of Kahalu'u Bay now. And like I said, it looks a little bit different, um, but it still remains this sacred and cherished place. Um, like I said, there's still this subtle magnetism that's sort of hard to explain, but it draws us here and it, and it um, always kind of instills us with this sense of wonder and this um, deep reverence. Along the shoreline, there's still these reminders of this storied past. The fresh water still flows from the springs that bubble up along the along the shoreline um, that create this very unique ecosystem, right? In this Kona, Kona lands, uh, relatively dry, um, but fresh water flowed, so it allowed people to, to live here and to thrive here. Um, and in the bay, there are hundreds of species, right? We, we, we call it this diverse biodiversity hotspot. It's this little mini, mini hotspot of life. There's um, hundreds of species of fish, there's invertebrates, there's juvenile fish that shelter and grow in the shallows, um, various types of coral, some of which are hundreds of years old, um, a diversity of lemu or algae that grows along the shoreline, um, shorebirds, uh, many of which who come to visit in the winter time, and, um, and, and honu that feed on the, on the lemu that grows in the bay and rest in the bay. Um, also, we see migrating humpback whales that swim by outside of the Menahune Wall in the winter, and oftentimes resting um, Hawaiian spinner dolphins uh, also on the outside of that wall and in the deeper water. So it's, um, it's this abundant and, and diverse place, um, even after all this change has occurred. So we really seek to learn from Kahalu'u Bay, um, you know, through the wisdom of its coral reef, and the abundance of diversity of its species through its fresh water that flows from the shoreline. Um, it's really just teaching us all the time, right? It holds this wisdom and, and we're so lucky to be able to experience that and to learn from it. And so that's really the foundation of our work. Um, this all sounds very nice. And like I said, a lot of people are drawn to this place and so many such that um, we, we've said over the past few years, the bay is really being loved to death. Um, this is a small 4.2 acre park. And um, for the past probably couple decades, it's been under immense pressure, right? Um, it's been drawn, uh, it draws over 400,000 visitors every year, which you can imagine in a small sensitive ecosystem like that, it's far beyond its natural carrying capacity. So, like I said, our stewardship program has been there since 2006. And early on in our work, we were focused uh, mainly on um, human behavior. Uh, fish feeding used to be uh, allowed and uh, encouraged. Uh, so we've, we've changed that. And um, now over the years, the Bay has shown the effects of, of being, um, being subjected to these, to these multiple stressors. So the human impact, but also um, water quality issues and climate change. Um, so it's, re it's led to this sort of rapid decline in, in the ecosystem, which has been difficult to watch. Um, so we're working to better understand those stressors and the way they interact and to do what we can um, to reduce them in the hopes that in reducing these stressors, we'll be able to um, increase the natural resiliency of, of the ecosystem. So one of the biggest issues that we face on a daily basis at Kahalu'u Bay is um, human damage, right? Um, overwhelmed by over 400,000 visitors a year, if you can imagine that. Um, now, in, at this time, it's kind of hard to imagine because we haven't seen many people at the bay lately, but um, this was a, a daily onslaught of, of visitors, uh, beachgoers, um, who were a lot of them unknowingly trampling the reef and the inner tidal zone, um, chasing and harassing marine life like turtles, um, and also introducing toxic sunscreen chemicals into the bay. 
Um, so along with this constant daily overuse, like I said, the ecosystem was dealing with uh, poor water quality and also the increasing effects of climate change. So kind of getting this, this triple, quadruple whammy of stressors um, all the time. And so as you can imagine, an ecosystem like this, it's hard to remain resilient in the face of all of those stressors. Another stressor, like I mentioned, was poor water quality. Um, as many of you know, we deal with uh, a barrage of cesspools along our coastline, um, especially down by Kahalu'u Bay. There's quite a few um, homes that are still on cesspool. So this, um, this uh, adds raw sewage basically directly into the nearshore waters. Um, also runoff from development. So as we develop more of our um, Mauka lands, our inland lands, um, and those become hardened, um, you get more runoff from when we get rain, so from car oil and things like that. Also, if you go even farther up Mauka, um, you know that there's a lot of coffee land and agricultural land um, inland of, of Kahalu'u Bay, and this often leads to agricultural runoff, so fertilizers and pesticides. So we find high levels of nutrients um, in the bay, which often leads to algae blooms, uh, blooms of cyanobacteria, and um, we've also seen an increase in coral disease. Um, and then the other poor water quality constituent that we'll, we'll talk about a little more later is um, the increase in concentration of sunscreen chemicals as well. And then the other thing um, just always looming in the background is, is climate change and the effects that come along with that. Um, over the last five years or so, marine heat waves have become more and more common, as many of you have witnessed with your own eyes. Um, and observations after the 2015-2016 coral bleaching event um, led to us discovering um, massive coral bleaching in Kahalu'u Bay and um, loss of species like the cauliflower cora, coral, um, upwards of 90% of all of those colonies uh, we lost in Kahalu'u Bay. So um, that was a big blow to the ecosystem. Um, and as it was kind of starting to balance itself out again after that bleaching event, unfortunately this past summer and fall, um, just four years later, we saw another, um, albeit less severe bleaching event, um, but it was still heartbreaking to see those corals that were just kind of rebounding a little bit um, from the 2015-2016 event um, bleach again. Uh, we unfortunately lost uh, a lot of our juvenile corals and some of the larger colonies, as you can see in these photos, bleached as well. So this really started to give us kind of a glimpse into our future, right? We know that these um, marine heat waves are gonna be happening more and more frequently um, and probably with more intensity. So like I said before, our goal is to understand these stressors, um, these additional more addressable stressors and work on those so that we can increase the coral's ability to fight off these um, kind of larger looming stressors like climate change. So that sounds awful, right? Um, all those things that, that ka poor Kahalu'u Bay has to, has to endure, but we have hope, right? We have to have hope. Um, we always have to have hope. And, and we definitely have, have hope at Kahalu'u Bay. There's signs every time I get in the water of, of why we have hope and why we have to keep that hope alive. Um, these two photos are a good, good example of that um, on some recent monitoring efforts to juvenile corals that we found, you know, in spite of it all, they were out there growing and looked to be fairly healthy. So we have hope um, and we have hope for a few reasons. Um, we have hope because since 2006, we've had this dedicated community-driven stewardship effort, um, just really dedicated to caring for Kahalu'u Bay and to empowering um, beachgoers and local businesses and school groups uh, with ways that they can help too. So um, I want to give uh, our, our shout out to our commi committed community stewards, right? Um, we have such a wonderful group of, of stewards uh, from our community and from really all over the world who have been trained uh, to help Kahalu'u 
all rooted in the Aloha spirit. So always with a positive attitude and, and welcoming attitude. Um, since 2006, since we began keeping track, we have um, empowered almost 700,000 visitors, uh, beachgoers with, um, with this type of information. So like I said, this program has grown and changed over time um, from fish feeding and now really to focusing on uh, sunscreen awareness, coral bleaching and water quality. So we're, we're changing with the times, but we're, we're as committed as ever to, to being there. Um, like I said, we've, we've trained reef teachers from all over the world. We have people who visit every year and wanna come back and help out. So it's a great, um, a strong model and and that's really what we we hope it is is a strong model for other communities that are interested around Hawaii and the world who want to take an active role in caring for for their cherished places and knowing that they have a say and they have um, the opportunity to help so we have our daily on-site education right we have um, our dedicated team down there every day seven days a week usually 300 and let's say 60 days a year when there's high surf or big storms we, we don't make it down there but um, we try to be there seven days a week and we really try to mitigate that human impact stressor so we're down there trying to encourage beachgoers to help protect Kahalu'u Bay in really simple positive ways so uh, floating in the bay right so avoiding stepping on rocks and coral and rubble we know um, that there's little juvenile corals uh, trying to grow out there. So we really try to encourage people to float in the bay, um, but also to respect all the bay's inhabitants. So to realize that each animal or plant out there plays an important role. And so one of the things that you can do is just float and watch them. Um, and we can um, never chase, touch, or feed, right? Um, but also we encourage people to learn more and use reef-friendly sun protection. Um, to cover up or use a small amount of mineral-based sunscreen. And we'll talk more about that as we go here. I'll talk a little bit more about um, reef-friendly sun protection. So yay for our reef teachers, right? They're, they are some of the most dedicated people I've ever known out there in the hot sun, um, getting, getting, uh, getting out there and, and doing the work on the ground, that face-to-face -face interaction. So this program wouldn't be what it is without, without all those people. So many of you might have heard about our um, sun reef friendly sun protection initiative. Um, we've really started a concerted effort um, back in 2018 um, to educate people about the harmful effects of sunscreen chemicals on the coral reef ecosystem. Um, I never thought I would learn as much as I have about sunscreen in the past few years, but um, man, is there a lot of, of misinformation out there. And so we really wanted to give people a simple kind of best practices way to um, help protect themselves from the sun, but also to help protect our marine ecosystems uh, from the effects of chemical sunscreens. So in 2018, like I said, we started this initiative, but we kind of wanted to track our results. So we also sampled uh, the water and we took water quality samples from five sites in the bay to see what were, our, were kind of our baseline levels of, of oxybenzone in the water. Um, and I think most of you know that in 2021, on the state of Hawaii will ban the sale and distribution of sunscreens containing oxybenzone and octanoxate, but um, those aren't all the harmful chemicals. So we, we will encourage you to use best practices, which I'll talk about here in a second. So when we got our results back from our 2018 sampling, um, the results were staggering. They were some of the highest results they had ever seen in the world. Um, the EPA has a, what they call risk quotients. And these risk quotients are basically um, the standard threshold for uh, risk to marine life. And um, the risk quotient for Kahalu'u Bay for oxybenzone was 262 times higher than the acceptable limit. 
um, set out by the EPA. So we knew we had a problem, but now we had the data to show that we had a problem. And so we were more determined than ever to get out there and um, educate people about this and actually not just tell them not to do it, but to give them um, resources to figure out how they could make it better. And so we began producing educational materials, um, hosting sunscreen swaps where people could come and turn in their chemical, uh, their harmful sunscreens, and we would provide them with, a, with an alternative. We provided daily free sunscreen samples um, down at the beach. And we also got out and talked with businesses, community groups, and schools about how they could also get involved as well. And then we all we went ahead and sampled again in 2019. So November of 2019, so a few months ago now, we sampled again to see if our um, what had happened to the levels of of oxybenzone in the bay. And we were so excited and really actually kind of surprised and shocked um, to find out that the levels of oxybenzone in the bay had dropped significantly. So I told you that in October. Uh, April of 2018, the level of uh, the risk quotient was 262 times higher. Well, that had dropped to only two times higher. So we were still at a high risk, but the, the level had dropped significantly. And if you take a look at this image, you can see the different sites in the bay and you can see um, just how big of an impact uh, this, this education and outreach had. And, you know, a lot of what we do is difficult to, it's not very tangible. Right. And and our education can be sometimes daunting when we see those those uh, large numbers of people every day. Um, but this was really tangible and this was really an exciting moment for us and for our team and um, really showed the power of of community stewardship and action. Right. Um, so this was really exciting for us and we're we're committed to continue this and um, Right now, like we said, there's a lot less people down there, but we're still down there every day um, talking with folks about it um, So what are the best practices, right? What everyone's saying? Well, what, then what should we do? So best practices are really first and foremost to cover up uh, wear your sun shirts wear your rash guards uh, wear your hats and your um, and your swim pants when you're out in the water um, avoid the sun during the peak hours. But if you are going to wear some sunscreen, you really want to check your label and you want to make sure that the active ingredients are either zinc oxide or titanium dioxide, um, non-nano zinc oxide. Um, the labeling is an issue, right? If you've been to the store in Hawaii, you've seen those reef safe labels. Well, a lot of those, most of those are not actually reef safe and there's no, um, there's no process by which you have to get a certification to have that label. Most of those just mean it doesn't have oxybenzone. Um, so really you need to be your own best advocate and read the label, um, read the active ingredients and make sure it's only zinc or titanium dioxide. Um, and more and more information comes out about this all the time, but currently um, the FDA only recognizes zinc or titanium dioxide as safe and effective. Um, the, the jury's still out on the other common sunscreen ingredients. So, um, you know, we'll be updating our information as time goes on. But right now we know that those are the two most common, uh, safe and effective ingredients. I always tell people, go find the baby sunscreens because that's uh, generally zinc oxide is what is in baby sunscreens. So we're, we're really happy about this. Um, we're not done yet. Obviously we're still over the, the threshold, um, but we're getting our numbers down. Um, something else we're really excited about is our coral spawning advocacy. Um, as many of you may have seen uh, in the past few years during the month of May, Kahalu'u Bay or Kahalu'u Beach Park has been um, often closed for a few days um, to encourage coral spawning um, without too much um, intrusion, right, by people. And so after the 2015-2016 coral bleaching event um, that really um, decimated the cauliflower coral populations on the west side of Hawaii Island, um, we began monitoring in Kahalu'u Bay for any survivors. Um, if you've snorkeled in Kahalu'u Bay pre-2015, 2016, you know that there used to be hundreds of these colonies dotting the dotting the reef, these vibrant browns and pinks, and it was really one of those kind of 
uh, beautiful sights to see out there. And then after this bleaching event, um, there were only about a handful left in the bay. And so we, we were happy to find about half a dozen or so um, adult survivors and then another you know, 10 to 15 actual juvenile um, cauliflower corals as well. A little bit later that year, we were alerted by our uh, partner agencies that there was a potential spawning event that was gonna happen in May and June. And so we, um, we decided that we were gonna advocate and ask for uh, the county to close the beach park um, to allow for this to happen um, undisturbed or relatively undisturbed because we knew that this was a critical, critical time for these uh, uh, coral colonies to reproduce. And if they didn't have successful reproduction, it could possibly mean the end of their, um, of this species in Kahalu'u Bay. Uh, we were so happy the county um, obliged and they said yes to a two half day closure. So the park was closed from uh, 7 a.m. to noon, two days in May. And we had our reef teach team out on the streets um, talking with people who were trying to come in the park, letting them know what was going on. And people were actually really supportive. Um, so we had our observation team in the water and we were so happy to report that we did observe one colony that did spawn. So we were happy to see that. Um, after that, we observed for juvenile colonies in the bay and we did find quite a few. Um, and so that was another really positive sign. And so 2019 came and we advocated again for another closure of the park. And um, this time, because of the success of the previous year, the county granted us two full days. We were so excited. Two full days of rest for Kahalu'u Bay was a big deal. And so our observation team again went out, our reef teachers were on the shoreline or on the uh, street talking with folks. And this time we observed three colonies that spawned. So again, another great success for this species, um, this iconic species. Um, important species in Kahalu'u Bay and, and on our coastline. Unfortunately, a little bit later that summer, we did experience more bleaching and um, a few of those juveniles did not make it. Um, but then again, in 2020, um, we advocated for a closure again. We were in a little bit of a different situation this time because our um, we were under the stay at home orders due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so there wasn't a lot of traffic at the Bay, but we still wanted to keep up that, that um, advocacy. And so this time we worked along with the state and the county, and they both supported a voluntary closure for one week, which was, I mean, I was like jumping up and down. I couldn't believe that they supported this one week closure. These types of closures are really the first, um, the first for, uh, any type of conservation efforts based around, you know, closing off a recreational area in the name of, of, of coral spawning. And so we're hoping that as this moves forward, um, we'll continue these efforts and, and solidify this even more. But um, we did observe one coral colony spawning. And I was going to share that with you because it's the most coral spawning, if you, if you have the chance to see it. It's probably one of the most amazing things uh, it, that you'll, you'll ever see. So let me see if I can share that with you guys. This was one of my favorite corals in Kahalu'u Bay spawning this spring. Just a very quick light spawn, but we were so happy to see that after the, um, I'll play it one more time, that after that bleaching um, last year, that this one was healthy enough to, to spawn. So we know there's little, little gametes that have settled on the bottom out there. Um, and so we continue to monitor and um, use this as a way to support and advocate for more regular rest periods um, during sensitive times and, and use it as a model for other uh, natural resource areas that are interested in doing the same thing because it's proven to be really successful um, with a lot of community support. And, um, and, we, and we hope that we can con continue doing this in the future. And I'm hoping this year we have a lot more um, coral recruits because we have far less people in the Bay the past few months. So I'm gonna move along here, um, oops, uh, uh, into another um, key part of our program and that is our ecological monitoring. Um, that's just 
I feel like a fancy way of saying, you know, really knowing your place intimately. And I feel like to help care for a place, you really do need to know it intimately. And you, you really want to get to know all the subtleties, the cycles, um, what's normal, what's not normal, um, what changes throughout the year. And that really helps you have a keen eye. And um, in Hawaiian, there's a word for that, and that's called kilo. It's to have deep observation, this, um, this tuning into nature. And it, it was critical for the survival of, of Hawaiians before we had uh, NOAA forecasting and um, other, other technological methods to, to observe and to monitor our places. So we try to do that. We try to really get to know Kahalu'u Bay and learn from Kahalu'u Bay on a, on a deeper level and to understand the cycles and the patterns. We do this in a few ways. Um, we have a water quality monitoring program that we uh, monitor temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, turbidity, uh, pH, and we've been doing this since 2009, so we have a long data set. Um, we've also been monitoring for uh, nutrient levels in the bay, um, and we will be actually starting to monitor for bacteria levels coming up in, later on in June. We're doing our first sampling for bacteria levels um, later on in June. Um, we also look at species abundance and diversity. Um, the photo in the middle here is one of, uh, well, one of my favorite species, but sadly it's not as common anymore uh, due to the loss of its habitat of the cauliflower coral. This is the Aloiloi, the domino damselfish, um, was once very common in Kahalu'u Bay, uh, but we started seeing them return and we've seen each year, we've seen about four or five in the bay, so really really awesome sign there. And then the picture on the far right is of a, a relatively small cauliflower coral um, that we've been watching grow. And so another part of our monitoring uh, or kilo is watching for coral recruitment and um, observing coral health in the bay as well. So it's always fun to get out there and, and, and join in with that. And all of our monitoring is really community driven and community um, led so there's always uh, reef teachers involved and um, it's really a, a team effort so the last thing i wanted to talk about in terms of um, our program is uh, our outreach and education so you know we're not doing this for us we're really doing it for the next generation so that we leave them with 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 a healthy kahalu'u bay um, this is really for their future um, so we are so lucky to have um, to be able to share this place with uh, students, both visiting and local students, um, and really connect them to this place and show them how special it is. And hopefully, um, you know, spark something in them like was sparked in me when I was younger uh, so that they can build their own relationship and be the next generation of stewards. So that's another key component of our program is to involve um, our future future stewards, right? Because this is this is for them. This is about the legacy we're going to leave for our for our future generations. So a lot of people have been asking me, "Wow, with with um, you know so few people at the bay, what's been happening? Have you seen a lot of changes?" And um, the short answer is yes. Uh, I didn't think I would see as significant of changes as I have over the past few months. Um, but we really have seen some pretty, um, pretty amazing things. And uh, I think the presenter before me said it and said it well that, you know, the ocean want, if we give it a chance, the ocean or nature in general always wants to heal itself. And this is just a testament to that. So we've seen um, quite a few things. One of the most surprising things I saw the other day was native plants returning to the beach. So normally there's hundreds of people that sit in the sand every day and without them, these seeds have that were dormant have started to grow. And we think this is the uh, beach morning glory, the pahui hui vine, which actually has a pretty cool story um, along with it, that um, back in the day, the kahuna of uh, when he would want to uh, bring forth big waves to surf, he would actually take a string of pahui hui vine and slap it on the surface of the water. And that was supposed to bring up the big surf. So I have never seen pahui hui growing at Kahalu'u before, but these little guys were popping up all over the, the beach um, the past few weeks. So that's been really exciting. 
Another thing is we've been seeing um, an abundance of limu growing um, or algae growing along the shoreline in places that are generally um, heavily trafficked. Um, I used to always think Kahalu'u Bay only had a like one or two species of limu. And now since it's been able to grow, we've identified a few more. Um, this green limu and red limu I had never seen before. So we're seeing um, more food for the honu and fish um, growing in abundance. Um, the coral, which spawned in May, uh, really spawned undisturbed. It had a long time to, to a week, about a, a week of that voluntary closure. And then since then, pretty relatively little human impact since then. So that's been really, really nice. And we'll be monitoring that going forward. And the other thing that's been really amazing to see is the abundance of marine life. Um, they've been, I, I've seen more fish than I've ever seen in Kahalu'u Bay utilizing the whole water column. Um, I've seen a, a, in this photo, you'll see there's a there was a juvenile honu, a green turtle, and then there was also this um, now fairly resident hawksbill, which is a critically endangered species, um, and they were actually checking each other out, and um, it's just been really cool to see them undisturbed. They're able to forage. They're able to rest on the bottom without being chased around um, by people. We've also seen some larger more predatory species. Um, we've seen some big jacks hunting around in the bay, which is a great sign, and a ton of juveniles, um, some of which we haven't seen before. So um, life is abundant and flourishing right now. We say just feels like the bay is able to breathe and rest a little bit. Um, so it's been really, really interesting to see that. So finally, I was going to share with you just a very short little video clip um, to kind of that highlights the changes, um, a few of the changes that we've seen. If you've ever been um, to Kahalu'u Bay and you've entered the water, you know there's that little um, channel, that natural channel that leads into the bay. And um, what's interesting here is the abrupt changes that we saw in, in the water here. So I'm going to share this with you. Um, and and then we'll, we'll wrap it up and I'll open, open up for some questions. Great, so that was just um, a little video that we put together that showed the change um, from March 10th and then, or March 20th to May 10th. And it just showed the um, extreme change in that, in that one area in particular that usually has hundreds of people every day kind of traversing through it. And um, anyway, uh, kind of highlights the changes that we've seen over the past few months. Um, but really this moment of pause has given us clarity, right? It's given us a vision for the future and we never believed in a million years that this was even a possibility for Kahalu'u Bay. And I feel like, um, you know, this has given us a chance to see what is possible and um, what we can expect and what we want for our future. Um, and so I invite you all to join us to help care for this place. Um, there's opportunities for everybody to get involved, um, whether you are live here or you visit here or you are a student or a teacher or a community organization. Um, there's, there's many different ways you can get involved. Um, and Kahalu'u Bay is really this, um, this model, right? Kahalu'u Bay represents um, all these other places that we all care about. 
Um, it just so happens that this is the place that we steward, but it really can, these messages can be spread out to, to really anywhere. And um, so I really appreciate the opportunity to give this presentation and to share a little bit about a place that I love so much. And um, I, like I said, I welcome anyone who's interested to get involved. Um, you can go to our website for more information um, or you can email me directly. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions or um, let you know how you can get involved. Um, we love to have uh, people come down and join us. So thanks again. And um, I really had a great time sharing with you guys today. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Awesome, Kathleen. Thank you so much. That was yeah. just amazing. Oh, thanks. Um, we are really happy to get all the great information on how we can protect our reefs. So it's fantastic. Um, we have had actually several questions. So Lou is asking, why is coral bleaching bad and what causes coral to die? Great question, Lou. Um, so coral bleaching um, is a basically a stress response. And so corals have a certain um, threshold of temperature that they can withstand. And when the temperatures exceed a certain, um, a, that certain threshold, what they do in, sim in the simplest terms is they expel this, um, this photosynthetic marine algae that lives inside their tissue um, that provides it with a lot of their nutrients. And so that's why you, s and, and also color. And so that's why you see that stark white um, bleached uh, color when we call it, when we see, when we say coral bleaching. Um, when coral is bleached, it enters this state of like extreme stress and it's really vulnerable and it can lead to mortality or death if the temperature doesn't return. Um, additional things can increase the stress. So, um, you know, poor water quality or human, human stress um, can also increase the likelihood that coral won't survive that. Um, what was the other question? What was part two? Uh, and what causes coral to die? Thank you. So much. Oh, yeah, it's, it's really due to the fact, so the photosynthetic algae that lives inside the coral tissue provides it with upwards of 80% of its nutrients. And so when that is expelled from its tissue, it's almost like it's starving. And so that's what causes, uh, what usually causes it to die. Great. Thank you, Kathleen. Yeah. Warren is typing in and he says that he really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, it was awesome. Yeah. And how can divers help? Oh, great question, um, Warren. Actually, we are right before um, the kind of stay at home orders took, went into effect. We were about to launch into a coral um, temporal texture monitoring program where we actually need scuba divers to um, go out and be able to um, do this standardized monitoring procedure and um, that we were going to use to show change over time uh, of the corals in Kahalu Bay. And it's just safer to use scuba divers because otherwise you're having to go up, you know, surface all the time as a snorkeler and that's, as we know, not safe. And so um, we do need scuba divers to help with that. Um, but the other way you can help is just, you know, taking these practices with you on your, on your dives and sharing them uh, with your fellow divers and friends. Um, we always say lead by example. That's, that's one of the best ways any, any person can help any ocean lover. Awesome. Now we have a question from our 12 year old who is an advanced scuba diver. Wow. Uh, and she completed the Reef Renewal Diver Distinctive Specialty while she was in Bonaire. Uh, oh. She said she worked on the coral nursery trees and transplanted coral. This is Inari. Uh, I am wondering if Hawaii has a similar program or is planning to start one. And if so, I would love to volunteer when I am in Hawaii. Great presentation, Kathleen. Thank you, Inari. You're, uh, you're very impressive with your ocean um, your diving skills and your love for the ocean, I, I, that makes me so happy. And I encourage you to continue and, um, and follow, follow your heart with that because we need, we need people like you. Um, as far as I know, there are a few um, places that are doing some coral propagation. Um, I know Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology over on Oahu at Mokulo'e, the Coconut Island facility. Um, and then I do believe that DLNR, the Division of Land and Natural Resources, um, the DAR 
organization here has been doing some uh, out planting, but I'm not as familiar with the program. So um, Inari, if you want to take my email address and I can try to connect you with the right people to learn more about that, I'd be happy to. Awesome. Yeah. Kathleen, we have another question from Lou that says, do turtles help coral reefs? Do turtles help coral reefs? Lou, you have, you've got all the good questions. Um, you know, the way I look at it is that all the animals in the reef ecosystem play an important role and um, the various functions that they, that they carry out. Um, one of the things that they do is they eat the limu or the algae that grows on the coral reef. And so, um, you know, we need those herbivores to keep the algae in balance. Um, too much algae can start overgrowing coral and cause kind of that, um, getting things to be a little out of, out of whack or out of balance. So um, yes, they do, they do help. Um, I haven't heard of an instance where they hurt a coral reef, um, but in general, I think each species generally plays a, an important role on the reef. Awesome. Great question, yeah. Now we have one from Allie. Uh, she wanted to know, my question just jumped, uh, why it's a positive thing for the larger predatory fish in the water like jacks? Great question. Um, so, so sort of similar to Lou's question, um, the reef is this balance, right? It's this delicate balance. And um, we know that when there are all the different um, levels of the uh, food chain represented on the reef, that it's in, it's in more balance, right? So it means that one level of that um, chain of the ecosystem or the food chain isn't going to get too big or too heavy. So the, the larger predatory fish help keep that natural balance um, of, of the ecosystem. So it's always exciting to see them come into the bay because they, they give off a whole different vibe than our sweet little uh, butterfly fish or, or um, you know, damsel fish. They come in and they, they look like they mean business. <laughs> yes, definitely. And they're so cool to see. Yeah, so cool. Yeah, we saw two, maybe three foot uh, jacks the other day and we went, whoa, we don't see that very often. So it's pretty cool. Fantastic. That's yeah. a good sign. Yeah. Jamie asks, uh, would we be able to get funding for more sunscreen swaps? Jamie, that's a great question. Um, we are, so if you know, uh, anything about nonprofits, you're always looking for funding. Um, we, our funding um, sources are, are mixed. We, we um, are always writing grants. And so that was one of the ways we were funding our sunscreen swaps. Um, we're also really lucky to receive some donations from businesses. Um, some of the sunscreen companies actually donated sunscreen to us um, and other monetary donations were also really helpful. Um, and as most of you know, we used to have our snorkel rental operation, which uh, brought in some funding for us as well, which we no longer have at this time. And so um, we are always looking for funding. Um, another way you can help get involved, obviously, is, is through donations. So if anyone's interested in supporting us that way, um, you can email me directly or, or go to our website as well. But yeah, we, we hope to be able to do that because it's a really powerful way to uh, spread the message because you're you're giving someone a full size swap and then they can take that and go, wow, now we know what, what to look for in the future. Awesome. Yeah. We have a question from Jean who's asking, has there been any talk about limiting the number of people per day? Thanks, Jean. Yeah, great question. Um, there have been talks. There have been talks about how do we come out of this? Uh, how do we move forward from the situation we're in now where we have relatively little human impact, you know, um, and how do we move forward in a more sustainable way? And so um, we're really hoping to work with all the stakeholders. Um, that includes the community, that includes the state, um, you know, who, who is in charge, who has jurisdiction over the water, and also the county who has jurisdiction over the, over the um, beach park. And so we're hoping if we can get everybody um, you know, to sit down and talk and figure out um, how we move forward in a more sustainable way, um, that we can, that will be part of the conversation for sure. Awesome. Yeah. And I think our last question is, have you seen other local ocean protected areas here on the Big Island with positive turnaround in reef health through programs like this? 
Um, you know, I'm not aware of any other programs uh, exactly like this, but um, um, there are other marine protected areas that have maybe um, different rules in place, uh, different than Kahalu'u Bay, that may provide a little more protection. Um, but I haven't seen anything specifically. And if anyone has any examples, please feel free to share because we're always looking to learn um, from other organizations that are doing similar things and vice versa, share our, our um, experiences with, with organizations that are hoping to do things um, that we've done as well. So um, I would be more than happy to, to sit and chat with you if you know of anything. Great. Yeah. Uh, we're looking forward to partnering with you more in the future. And everyone, please remember, if you'd like to donate to the Kohala Center, you can go to their webpage. Um, Kathleen's kindly put up her email as well, so you can ask her further questions. And right now, we're going to give away some Reef Safe sunscreen stream awesome. uh, and some other products that are uh, sustainable to help our oceans. So thank you so much, Kathleen, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Yeah, thank you guys so much. It was really an honor to be able to um, share about our program and share a little bit about Kahalu'u Bay. So I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Mahalo. Thank you. Mahalo. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.